to finish out day one. All right, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the next set of talks are the, constitute the aquaculture and genetics session. Uh, at 4.40, we'll conclude with the talks uh, and transition into a poster session and also the evening social or happy hour that they provide here. Uh, but with further, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Borski, who's going to talk about some of the sex determination in the context of stock enhancement. Hello? All right. Better lower that because I'm a loudspeaker. So. All right. Well, um, first I wanted to thank the uh, organizers for allowing uh, us to bring some, present some of our research from North Carolina State. It's been a great meeting. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is environmental sex determination. It's going to leave off a little where, where John uh, had spoken and its potential implications for aquaculture and stock enhancement. And before I begin, I'd like to thank uh, Jamie Mankiewicz, who is a PhD student in my lab, as well as John's, Adam Luckenbach, Poem, and Brittany. These are the grad students that drove a lot of the research that I'm going to show you today. And then Harry Daniels is also very important. He really raised these fish and develop the aquaculture and reproduction of southern flounder. So, as you know, southern flounder is a urihaline fish. It grows very well in freshwater as well as seawater. It is of high value and high demand. And in North Carolina and everywhere else, it's a very important commercial and recreational fisheries with two distinct genetic stocks, both in the Gulf of Mexico and along the uh, Atlantic seaboard here. Um, and this is just a picture of one of the fishermen we worked with when we were collecting some brood stock at some point. And uh, despite it being an important commercial fisheries, it is a declining one. Um, and Lori showed us earlier what's happening here is since 1994, there's been a substantial decline in commercial harvest of southern flounder. The female spawning stock biomass is also on decline, okay, suggesting fishing, overfishing is occurring, and hence stock enhancement programs are underway, I think, in Alabama, South Carolina, and Texas. So we at North Carolina State have been developing aquaculture technologies in freshwater recirculating systems at uh, North Carolina State. And in these studies, we show that females grow substantially faster and to a larger size relative to males. And in fact, males really aren't a good aquaculture candidate because they don't reach a large enough size for market. So the key here is to promote female production. These reach market size. And toward that goal, we've been interested in producing monosex populations of only faster growing female southern flounder and determining those environmental variables that might be best to produce natural or if you want one-to-one -one sex ratios. And a little later, I'm gonna show you the procedure we use to generate these all-female populations. 
So to begin then, um, as John discussed, southern flounder and all pyrolichthys have temperature sensitive sex determination that occurs during a window of sexual development between 35 and 65 millimeters. And uh, masculinizing effects of temperature occur at both high, 28 degrees, and low, 18 degree temperatures. So if we take the Y genotypic sex, that is the males, the XY males, and incubate them at different temperatures, you'll always get males. However, if you take the XX genotype or female, and you incubate them at a moderate temperature, we get females. On the other hand, if we raise them at low or higher temperatures, we masculinize the population. And this is just simply depicted in our research, we, research study we did many years back. All right, we were then interested in perhaps other factors that might regulate sex determination. And in fact, we ran a study and we had a problem. We had masculinization of fish at a permissive temperature. And what we realized is we used a different tank color. And so we, because flounder are camouflage predators, if you will, ambush predators, background color could be an important component where the improper background color could reflect a stressor that could lead to masculinization. And I really like this picture because here's a checkerboard and they do, they're very cryptic, they, they follow their background color. So we then wanted to evaluate if background color regulates sex determination. And so what we did is we uh, raised animals in gray tanks, black tanks, and blue tanks. Blue tanks are very common in aquaculture operations, just like pools. And what we found at 23 degrees, the female, the, the temperature that produces one-to-one -one sex ratios, led to one-to-one -one sex ratios in gray and black tanks, but in blue tanks, we get a substantial masculinization. Now, at the slightly masculinizing temperature of 19 degrees, as you see here, we have more masculinization in gray and black tanks. Over and above this, blue tanks cause further masculinization. We were then interested in whether cortisol, a stress hormone, and I'll talk a little more about this in a moment, might be involved in this process. Okay, we know cortisol is involved in temperature-dependent sex de determination in Olivaceous, the Japanese flounder, and this was a nice pioneering study done by Yamaguchi. And so what we wanted to evaluate was whole body cortisol levels in the rearing studies we did with different tank colors. And as you can see, prior to when sex differentiation occurs, prior to that period, you can see blue tanks cause an overall increase in whole body cortisol level, suggesting this hormone may be involved in the masculinizing effects of blue color tank or blue background. So if we look at the cortisol axis, basically any stressor, in this case light intensity, temperature, tank color, or density, could theoretically reflect a stressor in which a hormone called corticotropin releasing factor is released from the base of the brain. It acts on the pituitary gland to release adrenocorticotropin hormone, which then in turn acts on the inner renal gland to regulate cortisol production. Okay, and this is the same hormone that's the stress hormone in our bodies. It's the same profession as well. And then cortisol in turn may suppress aromatase. There's that evidence for that which would reduce the production of estrogen and the accumulation of testosterone and hence the masculinization of flounder. So what we did then is we, um, we evaluated the effects of exogenous cortisol on sex ratios in southern flounder. All right, and we did this by looking at, we determined sex by looking at aromatase and FOXL2 is indicators of female development, and of MIS, which John explained, as indicators of male development. 
And what you see here is what we used here was an all XX population. I'll show you how we produce this later. But what we did is we basically gave cortisol periodically every three days during days 0 and 14 of our study and during days 26 and 42 of our study. And then we raised these at 23 degrees in gray tanks at a low density. Without cortisol, this should give us 50-50 sex ratios. And what we found is that cortisol not only did not regulate weight gain, it, nor did it regulate linear growth. And this is very important because at high doses of cortisol, likely not physiologically relevant, you would get a suppression of growth. But we didn't really see that. And when we measure cortisol, we find circulating levels to be about three to four-fold higher than normal unstressed controls, which is within the stress response. And what we found is in these all XX fish and the controls without cortisol, we get predominantly females, which one would expect. And then, and, and then cortisol caused a dose-dependent masculinization of flounder, okay, where we got nearly a pure population of males at the highest dose. So our overall goal then, from an aquaculture perspective, would be to produce monosex populations of faster growing females. So what we did show is that background color as well as temperature can masculinize flounder. And this masculinization is likely due to a stress response observed by the fish in which cortisol leads to masculinization of uh, flounder. So now we wanted to produce monosex uh, culture of uh, southern flounder. And our strategy for doing this was to use gynogenesis along with uh, temperature-dependent sex determination. And to do this, what we do is we strip eggs from the female. And then we strip sperm from the uh, males. And then we. UV irradiate or deactivate the DNA in the sperm. Then we, the sperm is used to fertilize the eggs. Then we cold shock the eggs for about 45 minutes at zero degrees. And this is causes the retention of the second polar body. So you end up with a diploid all XX eggs. You raise these and you have gynogenetic juvenile. <coughs> All right, we validated the UV dosage, and I'm not going to go through all the details here, but basically we used about 70 millijoules per centimeter squared. That leads to about 10% sperm motility, but we found is effective in inactivating the DNA. And this is shown by a study in which UV irradiation of the sperm leads to induction of haploid syndrome. So if we look at this experiment, here you have a control egg. Here's a control sperm. You know, you combine those two, you get a normal diploid, XX or XY. Here, if you have a control egg and you UV irradiate the sperm, and if you've effectively knocked out the DNA, you still need the sperm to fertilize the egg to activate development. Okay, so fertilization requires contribution of a chromosome as well as activation of development. Here we remove the chromosomes effectively. And when you combine these two, you get haploid syndrome, and these haploid larvae are inviable. And here's your typical diploid larvae. All right, we then continued with a validation of our experiment on gynogenesis. And so I just showed you these first two parameters up here. So if we take these cold shocked eggs, you know, we, we take the sperm, we fertilize the eggs, we cold shock them, you should get triploidy. All right, and then here is the gynogens. You UV radiate the sperm, you fertilize the eggs, you cold shock them, you get all excess, you get all XX genotypic individuals. And what we did is we validated this by looking at the urethrocyte volume of the nucleus to look at whether our ploidy manipulation was effective. And what you see here is. Haploids have smaller urethrocyte volume in the nucleus of the nucleus relative to diploids, while triploids have significantly greater. This suggests then that we were able to induce the ploidy we intended on 
doing and that our gun genetic protocols were effective. All right, so if you take this, and now what, what I want to say here too is we've actually used mullet sperm and UV irradi irradiated it, and we are able to effectively produce gynecogenetic juveniles. We've also done this with pressure shock, so there are other ways to do it. But the point is, is if, if you have your gynecogenetic juveniles, you raise them at high temperatures that masculinize the fish, you produce XX genotypic males that produce functional sperm, you raise them as broodstock, you combine them with normal females, you get all XX individuals, and if you, if you raise them at that permissive temperature, that female determining temperature, we get all female production. All right, and we actually looked at the effects of stocking density using, again, these XX individuals. And here we don't see a major effect of growth uh, based on density. But if we look at um, masculinization, we see mostly females in our population. Some masculinization with the highest density and an intermediate density. But this is a way we can produce all female populations of flounder for aquaculture. All right, so um, I wanted to conclude then by, oops. All right, so in conclusion, we show that temperature and tank color, blue is for boys, uh, masculinize flounder during an early period of sex determination. And this process is likely mediated by cortisol, the major stress hormone in vertebrates, including fish. Uh, the rearing conditions that limit masculinization should be considered when we think of stock enhancement, okay? So you're not inadvertently stocking all males or a, proportion, a high proportion of males. And then we've developed gynecogenetic protocols as well as the rearing conditions necessary to produce all female flounder that grow much faster than males. And that's it. Thank you. I do want to thank our funding agencies and all the other contributors to this research as well. And this is really cool, um, something we want to try with these different colors. I didn't know color actually had so many parameters, but a guy in textiles tells us it does. So. I guess I got the first question. Max mm -hmm. Westendorf with the Alabama Marine Resources Division. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose blue, gray, and black tanks as opposed to something lighter like a sand-colored tank? Well, actually, we do want to use a sand-colored tank, which is why I brought this up. We just hadn't used it initially. Um, a lot of people use blue tanks in culture systems. Uh, black is more common and then light gray, so those are kind of the initial colors we did, we used. So we evaluated this. So my next question on mm -hmm. after that is, does that cortisol production happen, you know, that before that 35 millimeter size? Because w when we raise our fish, I raise them in a blue tank and right until post metamorphosis and I transition them to a tan tank. So my, that's my question. Have you looked at sex ratio? Not yet. We're about to, though. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good point. So this is a question that came up earlier. Um, we assume sex determination based on the evidence out there, and I think it's pretty convincing, doesn't occur until around 35 millimeters to 65. So I think what you do early on may not affect sex ratios, but could I say for sure? No. So what we typically do is we raise them, and here he would know more about this because he's done all that work, is we would raise the larvae, I think at like 14 to 16 degrees, slowly raise it up to like 18. You know, they metamorphose, and then we kind of put them in the temperatures we want to put them in. We do it earlier typically than the 35 millimeter, obviously, and then do our analysis. So I think to be conservative, it's best to do it as soon as they metamorphose. You put them in the conditions you hope will minimize masculinization. But I think we still do, should do more research to see if it happens even earlier. I, I don't know if a single event at a certain time could actually change all this. We, we just don't. 
Uh, Kim Walsh, LDWF. Did you try raising any of the triploidy XXYs to see if they had any of the female growth characteristics? Uh, no, we did not. That would be a, a separate element. We didn't do that. Um, the problem, of course, is we'd probably have to kill them to see if they were triploids. Um, or we could just do the control experiment, as we pointed out, and just assume they're triploids and, and, and then test that. But that would be interesting. I think it would be worth doing. We don't know if they become sterile even or, or whatever the case might be. Might even get better growth. Nancy Brown Peterson, um, Southern Miss. Following on that, has anyone looked at the XX males? I mean, do they grow like females? If so, you wouldn't even need that third step. <laughs> XX males grow like females. Do they? I mean, do they have that bigger, that better growth curve? They're not putting anything into gonads. It seems to me that they maybe would grow better. I mean, right. I don't know. Okay, so, so you're asking a very good question. We assume they grow just as well based on our data, but we can't go in yet and say, is this an XX? We can't identify the chromosome yet. This is a real problem with flounder biology right now is we need to determine the actual sex determining gene or a marker of the chromosome. So you can go in and take a fin clip, for instance, and say, this is a Y individual, this is an X individual. Um, we can easily do that with karyotyping and us, but, but we can't do that yet with flounder. So that is one of our goals, ultimately, is to get the, to be able to identify Y and X fish. Yeah, but you're making XX males that you're then crossbreeding with XX females. So you must know you have XX males. Right, right. So you just haven't grown up those XX males to see if they, if they follow the female traje trajectory or not. Uh, no, we haven't separated those two out yet, no. But we did use the populations of XX, all XX. But we haven't compared regular females, if you will, to gynegenetic XX. Yeah, Russ, this is, this is Fred Shaw from UNC. So were you surprised that the density treatments didn't cause the stress yeah, response? Yeah, we were, we were. It's interesting, I was just at the WAS meeting, the World Aquaculture meeting, and and I think olivaceous, they grow at incredible density. We thought they would sex reverse. They haven't looked at that, but but they don't. I, we can't, I mean, that, those, that's the data, we just don't. We get a little masculinization at the highest, but then at 1,000, there was none. So so we're, we're a little puzzled by that, but, but the data are the data. That's time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think everybody with a blue tank is rethinking things. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks tonight. <laughs> I, you know, I, I would like to say one little quick thing is I went to Korea where they do grow flounder and they do you use a yellowish tank and a greenish light. There must be a reason, they wouldn't say. It was a commercial farm, but I wonder, so. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Borski. All right, next up we have uh, Dr. Aaron Watson, again. Again, thank you for pinch-hitting this morning, and we're eager to hear from you about the enhancement program in South Carolina. All right, thank you. Thanks everybody for sticking around. Uh, again, Tanya was gonna give the first part of this uh, talk and then I was gonna step up and talk about our mariculture stuff. So eventually we may get to something that uh, I might sound like I know what I'm talking about. Um, and I'll also try to talk slower this afternoon than I did this morning, uh, but no promises. Um, so due to the recent uh, stock assessment that we've heard a lot about and declining South Carolina, or so uh, Southern flounder populations that we've heard a lot about, uh, the South Carolina legislature uh, took a few actions this past summer 
Uh, one thing I want to state here is that uh, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources uh, does not set our fishing regulations, especially for fin fish, uh, and our Marine Resources Research Institute does not do any uh, legislative actions or enforcement. We have a law enforcement wing of DNR that does enforcement. Uh, all of our fishing regulations are set by the South Carolina State Legislature, so the DNR, especially the Research Institute, is free to hopefully good do science, uh, do good science, and inform those management decisions, deliver options, uh, and, and we'll go from there. So some of the regulatory changes that occurred this past summer uh, is a reduction in bag limit uh, to five per person per day, uh, reduction in a boat limit to 10 per person per day, or 10 per boat per day, and then an increase in the minimum size uh, to 16 inches. Uh, this was among a variety of options that were presented to the legislature, and this is what they decided to go with, as well as uh, setting aside some funds for the development of stock enhancement program. And this was something that we did not think they were going to do. Uh, they increased all of these saltwater license fees in South Carolina, uh, and $5 of all those increases are going specifically to the Southern Flounder uh, stock enhancement development. Uh, and then they also earmarked uh, some money for the Waddell Mariculture Center, uh, production and pond renovations uh, funding so that we can renovate some of our facilities and some of our ponds uh, so that hopefully we can we can increase our productive capacity, uh, especially for Southern Flounder. So these are new as of July 1st this past year. So we are in year one of this program that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the folks after me uh, are going to talk about actually producing flounder. Um, so in South Carolina, uh, we utilize a responsible approach to stock enhancement, which sort of to uh, a medical doctor's Hippocratic Oath, uh, step one is do no harm. So no matter what we want to do uh, with stock enhancement, we do not want to harm the natural population. Uh, so we, we keep that in mind. That's the, you know our number one goal. Uh, so our brood stock are all collected uh, from local population. So you have to define what that local population is, where do brood stock spawn, where the uh, spawning boundaries, where the stock boundaries. Uh, and these differ for all the different species that we've worked with, whether it's red drum, spotted sea trout, cobia, uh, some striped bass work with our, our freshwater counterparts. Uh, they all have different different stories uh, along these lines. So different things to keep in mind. Uh, and then we want hatchery raised fish to look and act similar to wild fish. Uh, so flounder presents some uh, interesting issues with that uh, that our other species that we've worked with so far do not. Uh, also, uh, keys to this part is understanding the wild population uh, and then producing fish in a hatchery setting. How do we do it? So southern flounder for us is going to be an entire switch of gears uh, from doing extensive culture, which is how we've done spotted sea trout, cobia, red drum, to primarily intensive culture, uh, as you'll hear about in the subsequent uh, presentations. So it's a complete shift in gears in infrastructure-wise, effort-wise, uh, and skill-wise for us. Uh, and then one of the other things that we work on is small-scale experimental releases. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, genetic tags in a minute, but this is what we use uh, for all of our species in stock enhancement to determine our contribution to the wild population. So all of our brood stock of all of our species are genotyped. Uh, we know all of our spawns uh, that are raised in our ponds and released. When those fish uh, are caught by our inshore fisheries group or any other group, cooperating anglers, and we get a uh, non-lethally sampled fin clip back, we can determine not only was that fish a hatchery fish or a wild fish, but what tank did that fish come from? What, what, uh, who are its parents? and what spawning design did it come from. So it allows us to ask lots of questions about wild populations. So some of the things that we're going to take from our red drum, cobia, spotted sea trout work and apply to southern flounder, what are the best sizes to release? What are the best modes of release? Whether is it uh, directly at a boat ramp um, from, our, uh, from a trailer, or do we put the fish on a boat, drive them up into the estuary like we do with red drum, release them into a, more, a much more optimal scenario, uh, different, releasing at different salinities? What's going to be the best uh, for these larvae, these juveniles as we're releasing them? And we can get data that can help answer those questions uh, by these genetic tags and being able to trace our fish all the way back to what genetic family they came from in the hatchery. So the development timeline uh, for our the Southern Flounder uh, program, you, know, you can't spin up a program like this overnight, especially as I talked about switching from extensive culture to intensive culture. Uh, so uh, while this is not an immediate plan, it is an extremely aggressive plan. Uh, we've been working with Red Drum for 30 years. Uh, we've been working with uh, Cobia for 15 years. Uh, and, and our anticipated output of Southern Flounder is expected to be uh, equivalent, if not higher. Um, so we are hitting the ground running in year one. Uh, and that's primarily what I'm going to talk about, broodstock collection, infrastructure upgrades, uh, planning of uh, spawning induction experiments, as well as a bul the bulk of our genetics, our population genetics group developing those genetic markers that I just talked a little bit about. 
following that, years two through four are primarily geared towards continuing broodstock collection, continuing spawning experiments, beginning larva culture experiments as we hopefully spin up live feeds culture, which is something we have very little capacity for currently, uh, as well as refining those genetic tools, uh, getting more samples from around the region uh, for genetic population analysis. Uh, and then hopefully by year five, some small scale releases. So like I said, we can begin to answer some of those questions. What are some of the best ways to release these fish, best sizes to release, best time of year to release, since we can track these animals and answer some of those questions, hopefully. And then years five through eight are geared towards uh, uh, scaling up the program. Uh, as well as, and then hopefully in year eight is when we're currently targeting, you know, the first large scale, uh, however we want to define large scale uh, in terms of numbers, um, but hopefully towards the end of that period is the large scale release. So genetic tool development. Uh, this is something that our, our population genetics group does for all the species that we work with, uh, as I talked about before, and then primarily for southern flounder, uh, the process has been to undertake whole genome sequencing of known males and females uh, with Illumina uh, MySeq paired in sequencing. This returned about 17 and a half million merged reads and then utilizing uh, MSAT commander uh, to determine microsatellite uh, repeats to try to hexanucleotide repeats that can be utilized for these markers. Uh, 10,900, uh, so almost 11,000 primer pairs were developed. And then selecting the markers to use out of that uh, set of 11,000, 100 have been selected for initial testing and they're being tested on seven individuals uh, from South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, 28 uh, markers went underwent further, 28 of the 100 underwent further testing with 30 individuals from, from a slightly larger, uh, larger region. And then final testing uh, is gonna happen with an additional 30 uh, fish samples. Uh, and then this is a part of a process to determine Heidi Weinberg equilibrium, language disequilibrium, null allele verifications, making sure that these markers are doing what they're supposed to do, not doing what they're not supposed to do. Uh, and then panel selection and multiplexing uh, is, is a key ingredient, a key step in this at the end uh, to develop multiplex panels. So we're aiming for around 25 uh, microsat markers for southern flounder, and this is compared to anywhere from 12 to 19 that we work with for our other species. So this should be a very strong panel in determining parentage. Uh, so the genetic stru structure, uh, we talked a little bit about this, but there's a, a flounder working group. Uh, most of y'all who I probably do not know are probably in the room, uh, but this is a, a regional group that's been put together by uh, Dr. Tanya Darden uh, to help the study design with adult collections prior to spawning, uh, that spawning out migration October through January, hopefully collecting 200 per area per year, uh, and then young of the year collections following uh, the summer, uh, targeting 150 per area per year. Uh, and this is a, for, a coordinated fin clip collection program, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, uh, the Atlantic collections, and then Florida, Gulf of Mexico locations. Uh, and so this started just this past uh, uh, fall and winter of 20, 2021 into 2022. Uh, but this is an effort to increase that database uh, that we have on the population genetics and better understand uh, population structure, potential substructure, uh, allow us to target our broodstock collection uh, and our releases uh, more appropriately as I talk about with, with that uh, responsible approach program. So we made it to Mariculture. Um, so the Marine Resources Research Institute uh, on the left there uh, is where I'm located in Charleston, South Carolina. And on the right is our, uh, is part of our, our Mariculture section uh, in Bluffton, South Carolina, the Waddell Mariculture Center. Um, so different facilities, we all work with the same species. We have very different challenges uh, with infrastructure and, and facility design. So our current systems, uh, historically with all of our other species, because we've done uh, extensive culture, uh, Charleston was the location of all of our broodstock. Uh, so broodstock are all kept in recirculating systems. Uh, we currently maintain 10 12-foot diameter systems, five for red drum, two for cobia, one is still maintaining uh, spotted sea trout, and two are currently open for flounder. Uh, we have no active intensive larva culture uh, or larva culture systems uh, in Charleston, although that is slowly changing. Uh, and then down at Waddell Mariculture Center, uh, all broodstock again are collect in, kept in recirculating systems in a newly renovated hatchery. Uh, they have one 20-foot system that's currently housing cobia and triple tail, two 12-foot systems, two 10-foot systems uh, that are cut, uh, uh, housing mostly cobia and triple tail families. And then we currently have smaller systems, five and six-foot diameter systems uh, for a couple of bait fish broodstock species, uh, as well as uh, that's where they're currently housing the flounder that they have in-house. Uh, however, one, one thing Model does have is they have active live feeds culture and intensive uh, larva culture for bait fish species projects. 
So first thing we want to do, uh, we talked about the temperature sensitivities, uh, environmental parameter sensitivities that flounder have, especially compared to our much more tolerant uh, spotted sea trout uh, and, and red drum species, is we want to upgrade a lot of our systems. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with these new funds, uh, upgrading our water polishing systems, upgrading our YSI monitoring systems uh, to be uh, much more state of the art uh, than where they were when they were built. Uh, we're also undergoing internal or indoor uh, system and infrastructure upgrades that includes uh, development of a small recirculating system addition uh, in Charleston for our brood stock, uh, which is currently kind of the, the quarantining uh, and early, uh, early housing uh, place for our, our um, flounder brood stock, as well as a hatchery retrofit that we're turning a previously utilized room for uh, live feeds and algae culture into a hatchery. Um, and then uh, hopefully spinning up live feeds production capacity as well, since that will obviously be needed. Down at the Waddell Mariculture Center, uh, I just mentioned that this was a recently renovated hatchery. Uh, you can see there, 2016 to 2021, renovations were completed. This was another set of, of state money uh, that allowed us to insulate the hatchery, uh, upgrade the water polishing system. Uh, this, is the, this is the hatchery at the facility where we use ponds, so we're no longer bringing raw water uh, into the hatchery. Uh, we're bringing polished water in. Uh, new electrical plumbing, uh, building recirculating systems. Uh, so this, uh, can, this hatchery can have everything from broodstock collection uh, and housing to spawning experience experiments, larvae and early juvenile uh, experiments, and then our hatchery genetics experiments. And blue tanks that we will apparently be painting. Um, <laughs> So our, our primary goals for year one uh, on the mariculture side of things have been centered around broodstock acquisition. Uh, so we wanted to collect wild southern flounder. Obviously, um, uh, since we're a stock enhancement program, all of our broodstock are always wild. We rotate broodstock of all of our species every few years and only to utilize them as broodstock for a handful of years each. And we can do that. We can determine uh, when all of our fish have spawned. If they haven't been contributing, we can rotate them out, that sort of thing. Um, our goal for year one was 20 to 30. Uh, and just by, in, in Charleston at MRI, uh, putting a mariculture boat in the water and following an inshore fisheries trammel net survey that you heard about uh, earlier today, uh, we've collected 64 that we have in-house in Charleston, and then uh, Waddell actually has 18 in-house, so that number's been updated since the fall. Uh, they are housing uh, their fish in five and six-foot systems currently, as we are uh, for the time being. Um, and they are doing a much more directed nighttime fishery with some of our scientists and biologists there, as opposed to relying on our inshore fisheries uh, collection methods. Um, so the goal for this uh, first set of fish has been to uh, convert them onto to cut feed uh, from needing to be on live feeds. And then uh, we'd like to, in the next few weeks, be transitioning about 75% of the fish we have into those larger 12-foot diameter broodstock systems for further thermal conditioning. Uh, we're going to maintain some of these smaller diameter systems. Uh, they are much easier to access and manipulate. Uh, we've heard about uh, injections and having to strip spawn these species. And so our goal is to keep some of those in some of these smaller systems that are easier to manipulate. Uh, year two, we're going to move into spawning experiments. Uh, so volitional spawning uh, ha has been extremely challenging to achieve with southern flounder. It's extremely challenging to achieve in numbers for a stock enhancement program with any species. Uh, so we're, the solution there is going to be hormone-induced spawning and strip spawning, which is something that Dr. Jason Broach, who's our scientist at the Waddell Mariculture Center, uh, has a great deal of experience, experience in, in in a lot of species. Uh, and so moving into this winter, we hope to do some spawning-induced hormone uh, used in other species, uh, hopefully uh, up to four treatments, GnRH2, uh, flounder-specific GnRH, hopefully, as well as with and without a dopamine antagonist, just to see if we can get them to spawn uh, and then work on some of our larva culture methods. Uh, and then hopefully we'll be moving into to a flounder-specific type hormone uh, if some collaborations on that end uh, work out. Uh, we'd also like to look at pond experiments. Like I said, we we don't have a lot of uh, live feeds culture. Um, we do not want to necessarily raise uh, flounder in ponds, but we would like to uh, analyze what our ponds are able to bloom in the winter, and is that harvestable to bring into the uh, hatchery as a live feeds uh, chain alternative. Uh, so we are exploring the potential to develop zooplankton harvesting tools. Uh, this is something that we'd like to use at our, at our facilities, regardless of the species that we're talking about. Um, but it's something that we think could be advantageous in getting uh, larvae of any species more natural feed items. And so then um, upcoming opportunities, uh, I'm not going to call them challenges, um, but you know, li developing live feeds culture, uh, larva culture system development, uh, finding out what's going to work for us. We're already leaning heavily on the other folks that are ra already raising southern flounder to learn what does and doesn't work. Uh, we are not trying to beat our head against the wall. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so we're trying to be highly collaborative in that nature, as well as work with the University of Miami folks with the, the olive flounder, uh, San Diego, or the, in San Diego, the Hub Sea World folks with uh, the California halibut, which is another paralictid species. Uh, I mentioned the zooplankton um, production in winter. Uh, obviously 
obviously we, we are aware that the sex determination and sex ratio uh, is an issue that we will will run into. Uh, so dealing with that as we come to it, but that is not uh, by any means the first bridge we have to cross, uh, as well as that sexual maturation and, and, and determination. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at uh, for zooplankton production is uh, utilizing NMR-based metabolomics to profile natural feed items versus intensively cultured feed items and see what sort of nutrients uh, we may be missing uh, in an intensive setting. And then we're working with uh, Dr. Aaron Lagaki, who's now uh, was with NIST and now will be at the USDA, uh, who's doing some really interesting stuff with fish mucus uh, and determining sex based on hormone markers in the mucus, as well as potentially uh, sex deter or uh, maturation stage. And that's something that seems to be working very well in salmon, and we're trying to apply it to uh, actually several of the species that we're working with, uh, but including southern flounder. Uh, and then as a note there at the end, um, because I'm selfishly trying to learn as much as I can about flounder, um, Prior to us starting to collect broodstock, I hadn't touched a flounder since the mid-2000s when I was in grad school at the University of Texas. Uh, so I agreed to host a flatfish session at Aquaculture America next year, uh, and that is in New Orleans. Uh, so hopefully uh, a lot of folks here that have any aspect or anything that comes close to aquaculture or just wants to come and present about flounder, uh, let me know. Uh, and if anybody would like to co-chair, uh, I'd love to have some help as well. Um, that's it. That's all I've got on this talk. Um, so I'd be happy to take uh, any, any questions. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, I was wondering, so where are you guys currently at? Are, are people making the fish now, or...? I know you're developing a lot of this to make it much larger, but we're curious here in North Carolina, which is just where you guys are. On, on, we are we are uh, we are at the broodstock collection, uh, transitioning okay. into transitioning them to cut feeds uh, and beginning conditioning cycles. Uh, we started collecting uh, fish in August. Um, and so we had no females that reached a point uh, this winter that we thought uh, were ready for any sort of injection. Uh, so it's just been that stage and, and infrastructure development and, and writing really big POs for infrastructure. <laughs> well, if you guys ever need anything, let us know. <laughs> yeah, I, we will absolutely be calling. <laughs> I was, um, I'm Andy Fisher with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. I was wondering if you have any issues with uh, feeding your brood stock, if, if you've had any mortality issues. So I hope this is wood. Um, we have lost one brood stock that we've brought in out of that 80-something now, uh, and it was actually lost uh, about four or five days after we brought it in, so we don't think it was a feeding issue. Um, we have not had uh, a lot of trouble getting uh, fish to transition over. It has been a slow process and taken a while, um, but we have been uh, relatively successful so far. I'm curious to uh, this is Patrick Banks with Wildlife and Fisheries here in Louisiana. I'm curious to know how many folks you have working on this particular project. And how did you all determine that the $5 license fee was enough to fund the entire thing? Um, yeah, that is a, is a good question. Um, one of the things uh, that I'll preface that with is that um, we offered several overall budgets um, to develop um, what we had in capacity um, currently in terms of uh, square footage and footprints and if we were going to do this intensively versus extensively, if we were going to dedicate uh, a certain amount of funds to a flounder specific survey for our inshore folks uh, and then how much the genetic work would cost. Uh, how much the genetic work would cost is really the only thing that has a solid dollar amount on it. Um, everything else is, well, you know, we, we either need to build a dedicated facility, which was kind of outside of the realm of, of what was on the table, uh, or this is how much we need to support X number of staff uh, and, and develop these infrastructure changes that we can do, we can move forward with the footprint we have. Um, and so we got the, the $5 from each license and going to this program. Um, like I said, however, uh, some of the licenses went up by more than $5, so there is other uh, saltwater fishing license funds that are available and being spread out to other programs. Uh, so the, the increase was not just for flounder, um, but that was the, the dollar amount that they, they decided on uh, combining, and that 
is ends up being based on the average number of license sales um, a little bit north of the budget we said this is what we think we need to start Great. Well, we're going to stay on the topic of stock enhancement. We're going to move to Alabama, and Max Westendorf is going to tell us all about it. Good afternoon. I appreciate y'all sticking around and not running off to your hotel rooms yet, bringing up the rear here. Uh, my name is Max Westendorf. I'm with the Alabama Department of Conservation and Marine Resources. Uh, I'm the hatchery manager at the Claude Petit Mariculture Center. So I'm going to talk about our stock enhancement efforts specifically towards the southern flounder. Um, so uh, Alabama Marine Resource Division operates the Claude Petit Mariculture Center. Uh, it's an intensive culture system. Uh, that's our intensive culture building. Uh, it was finished, uh, construction finished around 2014, 2015. It's about a 23,000 square foot wet lab. Uh, and we have a lot of capacity in there. We have our broodstock conditioning. We have incubation, larval and fry rearing, um, some recently renovated rooms for flatfish specific culture, uh, some live food, live food production capabilities, uh, an analytical laboratory, and cold storage for uh, a walk-in freezer and a walk-in cooler uh, for different uh, different needs, and we also have an extensive culture system, which consists of 35 uh, fifth of an acre ponds. That uh, that our facility has been around since the early or since the 1970s. Um, we lined the ponds in the 1980s, so that that infrastructure has been there for quite a while, and it's still operational. Um, so I'm I'm very blessed uh, for the people that came before me because they had the foresight to get us some really nice water sources for our facility. I think it gives us a, a definite leg up on what we do in the, on the mariculture side. That we have we have two water sources. Uh, our first one's a full strength saltwater uh, pump that we run off the front beach at the Gulf uh, the Gulf State Park. Uh, we move water about three miles underground and can bring in a pretty. I mean, the lowest I've ever seen that's about 28 parts, uh, and the highest is about 36, 37. Uh, so we always have that nice clean high salt content water at all times. And we also have a, a pump on the intercoastal waterway, which we can pump in brackish water uh, anywhere from two to 20 parts, depending on rain. But I can use that how I want. You know, if I want fresher water, I can mix the two sources, especially in the pond. So I can get the same salinity in my extensive culture systems year round. I don't have to worry about any variability. So cheers to those that came before me. Uh, we currently work with four different species right now. Uh, we started with red drum to kind of cut our teeth on the new facility, and we've transitioned to uh, spotted sea trout, Florida pompano, eastern oysters, and southern flounder. Uh, we do rotate all these species. I kind of do it by the season that we do flounder in the winter. Uh, we do trout in the spring and fall, and we do pompano through the summer. So it all kind of meets nicely in there, and now we're squeezing an oyster somehow. Uh, in the spring. So um, I'm not going to really recap Dr. Power's presentation because that's what this slide's all about. But the big takeaway here is the kind of noted that it, at the height of the fishery, we were seeing about 400,000 annual recruits. So we kind of try to scale back our releases based on that 400,000 number. We don't really want to exceed 10 or 15 uh, percent of that number annually. So we kind of try to cap our numbers at about, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80,000 releases for now until we get a better understanding of the impact that we're making. Um, so you asked, in the previous presentation, you asked about keeping new fish alive, and that's been a struggle for us to get started. But uh, So all of our fish are wild, wild selected fish. So we annual, we bring in annual or fish annually, and we move fish out on an annual basis to kind of mix up that uh, genetic pool annually. Uh, it turns out we're really, uh, the biologists in our lab especially, are really terrible fishermen. Um, we make good biologists, but really terrible fishermen. And we spend a lot of effort trying to collect fish to come up with absolutely nothing. Uh, we've gone to the extent to try and dive offshore in the middle of January to live collect flounder off, off some wrecks. Uh, that didn't work. Um, so we've enlisted people that are good at it. And we use the Saltwater Fanatics Fishing Tournament every summer. And they've 
usually produce about 50 to 60 fish for us. Still primarily getting females from those tournaments because those guys like to get the bigger fish, but we are getting some. And also shout out to Dylan Keene at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab that, you know, for about four, four years of trying to produce male fish, we came up with maybe two or three dozen, and he gave us about 45 and about an hour and a half's worth of fish in one day. So shout out. He's quite the angler. Um, so once we bring our fish in, we put them through a quarantine process, uh, and after about three to four weeks, we can introduce them to our breeding populations. It was a big struggle when we first started to actually get our fish to eat, that we are, they are actively starving themselves to death with what we are offering them, and we didn't really want to offer them live feed to keep them alive because it was going to be hard to wean them back off of it. Um, but once we got a handful of fish that actively started eating, it was very easy. So we don't lose any more fish that we bring in. They kind of cue off the other fish that are in the systems, uh, and they feed fairly readily. Um, so we use finger mullet and local head on frozen shrimp as a diet. We've, we're starting to rotate in some fish breed M when they'll eat it. They don't really like to eat it. Uh, so we're trying to sneak it in different ways. Uh, and one thing we also found is we had the luxury that Auburn university grows shrimp in our ponds during the summertime. Uh, and they kick us some extra PLs and we grow out four or five ponds worth of live shrimp and we harvest them right before, uh, or right at the end of summer and we hold them, quarantine them and we'll offer live shrimp when they're leading up to their spawning period to really make sure they're getting everything that they can. Cause they were eating about one or two finger mullet every other day for about maybe 30 or 40 fish, but I could put 250 shrimp in the tank and they'd be gone overnight. So I knew that they could eat more. So we offer that for about a two to three month period in addition to the other parts of that diet leading up to it. And we've seen some really good success from that. Um, so when it comes time, we really we only have two tanks that we select from. We keep a male tank and a female tank because the females are pretty aggressive and they'll kind of tear into the male fish and, and, and kick them off the food. Um, so we'll select them out kind of visually through our window and it's not too tough. We use a long handle net and kind of say, I want that one and we pick it out. Uh, and then we give it an assessment from a one to four. Uh, and we only spawn fish that score between a three to four. And you can see I've kind of got a, a really nice looking female in that top corner. Those are the fish that we're looking for. Uh, so then we strip spawn them. Uh, we use ovoplant liquid. Uh, we inject at a 50 microliter per kilo rate. Um, do an intermuscular injection. We don't inject the males. They, they're naturally ready to go when the time comes. Uh, about 48 hours later, we're ready to... Uh, ready to strip spawn those fish. Uh, and we usually get productive spawns after 48 and 72 hours. Some fish take a little longer. If you have to apply any, you know, excessive effort to, to strip spawn that, we, we give them another 24 hours and try again. Uh, and if you wait for that fourth day, they really, they'll give you some eggs, but we don't get any productive spawns out of those. Um, one big, one big thing that we did better this year is we're paying a little bit more attention to the milk quality. Um, I was never very good at analyzing milk, and it turned out I was trying to fertilize my eggs with a lot more urine than I was milk. And I got a nice lesson from Dr. Ian Butts at Auburn of how to really look for that good milk. Um, so we had a lot better success this year when I was using actual sperm. Um, <laughs> imagine that. Uh, fertilization takes about 15 minutes mixing in a beaker. Uh, we typically get fertilization rates anywhere from 60 to 90%. Um, larva culture, this is, we'll kind of talk about, I'm, I'm kind of tucking my tail between my legs a little bit after those sex determination presentations because that got me rethinking everything I'm doing. Uh, but we hatch our fish out at, about 72 hours after they're fertilized, we get hatch out at about 16 to 18 degrees. Uh, and then about another three to four days, they'll uh, absorb that yolk sac and be ready to be fed. Uh, and at that point, I bump them up a degree a day until we get to 23 degrees, and I'll raise them out at 23 degrees for the duration of the time that we have them. Um, so we see metamorphosis, or we, we begin rotor for feeding right at day four. Our temia feeding begins at day 14. Uh, the earliest metamorphosis we see is day 22, day 23, and a, a few days after that is when I'll start the weaning process. This was the first year I actually successfully weaned my fish, which was a game changer for our pocketbook because our team is really expensive, um, and I really didn't feel comfortable taking that on because we, when you start that weaning process, you'll lose some fish to starvation, but it, it worked out this year and saved a lot of dollars and raised a lot of fish. Um, and we uh, 
we typically well, we typically release anywhere from day 42 to day 50 based on how, how large they are. We, we aim for about an inch and a half to two inches in size when we release them. Um, so we were lucky enough, our, our local CCA chapter donated us some money to renovate some existing systems. So we've, you know, flatfish are more regulated by uh, not, not volume, but surface area. So we came up with these small raceways to retrofit these decks that were already in place. Uh, and it's greatly uh, uh, bumped up our capacity for what we can raise. And I kind of backed into the sand colored tanks here. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Uh, that was just on a kind of using some intuition of, well, the sand is sand colored. They like sand. So let's go with sand colored. And here we are. Um, but that's been great for, for up and up, up on our capacity and what we can grow. Um, so release was, we kind of realized the first time we let fish go, we typically with other species back down a boat ramp and pull the, pull the valve and they just swim away. The flounder just kind of lay there. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of predators that hang around those, uh, those boat ramps. And when you see the pinfish tearing up what you just grew for three months, it doesn't feel very good. And then there's boats waiting to come in behind you that you're worried about them running over the fish with their trailer. So we determined, let's go ahead and try and put those fish in their habitat. Um, so we have this flats cat boat that we've retrofitted or that we've outfitted with a trolling motor, uh, some nice power poles so we can kind of draft in about six inches of water with that boat and we'll load coolers on and rig up an oxygen system. Uh, and we just kick that trolling motor on and we start trolling up and down the coastline and get a siphon going and slowly siphon those fish out so we can cover, you know, I think we covered the entire length of the little lagoon and release fish along the North shore because of wind that day. Um, and it, it was pretty effective. We saved most of our fish. It wasn't a big, we kind of need to add a better oxygen regulator system to that boat. Trying to balance it with roll valves doesn't really work out. Um, it created a lot more stress. Um, but our program has kind of taken some pretty good steps in the last few, year, few years. Um, we got our first successful spawns and release in 2020. We did about 12,000 fish. Following year, about 34,000. And this year, we grew about... 118,000 fish up to about an inch and a half average size. Um, we lost one or, or two coolers on, in transit trying to get them to the boat ramp and launch that the, uh, our pinch valves didn't really do their job and we opened up some coolers of dead uh, flounder, but we will correct that for next year. Um, future projects, yeah, there, there's a lot of unanswered questions here. Um, one of the big issues is malpigmentation that we get a lot of you know malpigmented fish, and I'm, I'm the king of anecdotal information, and I gotta somehow put that into actually studying something and coming up with some useful information. But I retained a couple of those malpigmented fish a few years back, uh, and I, out of necessity, started feeding them grass shrimp. And they, you know, these fish were about two and a half to three inches when I retained them, and I started feeding them grass shrimp, and that fish and below is the end result that they actually started to develop. They don't look normal. They're, you know, it's not a normal pigmentation pattern, but they were developing some color because we were asking that question because we weren't culling the, mal the malpigmented fish. So we're asking, are these fish going to live? Are people going to be reeling in albino fish in a couple years and come screaming at us? Um, but this gives us a little bit of confidence that as long as their feet on a, have a wild type offered to them, they still have the opportunity, especially at an early age, to start developing pigment. Um, obviously sex determination is something we really need to consider. Um, Paul will talk a little bit about what their processes are in Texas. They're a little different than ours and we kind of need to G-haul together and figure this out. Um, and then we also need to look at our post-release survival and impact and genetics as well. Um, and one study that we're actively working on right now is the cryopreservation of sperm with Dr. Ian Butts at, at Auburn. Uh, the thought is that you know, we, we want to get as diverse of a genetic profile as we can for these fish when we release them. So if we can take 100, 200 males and crowd preserve little small increments of their sperm when it's time to, to fertilize our eggs, we can pull 200 fish from our sperm bank and get a more diverse fish instead of spawning one female with five males, we can spawn one female with 200 males. So it'll kind of spread that genetic effect out a little bit. Um, so we're pri a lot of our work is primarily funded through the uh, wildlife and sport fish uh, program and also our flounder through the uh, Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission. Thanks, Steve. 
uh, and we partner with Auburn University and CCA for other for other projects and funding as well. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody's got. Um, David with Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries again. Uh, when you weaned the larval fish onto a dry diet, what size was that at? Was that before the sex determination phase? Yes. Um, actually, all of our fish are released before the sex determination phase. So that 35 millimeters, three and a half centimeters is right kind of on that edge of where we release our fish. So we really need to consider either retaining those fish to try and make sure that they get that 50-50 uh, split, or we need to start our runs depending on what we think the temperatures are going to be so that when we release them at that 35 millimeter size, that they're going into a condition where they can be a, a 50, as close to a 50-50 ratio as we can. I was, because I, I was wondering if, if cortisol might be driving the masculinization of the population and if you've successfully got them on a dry diet could you incorporate like a cortisol blocker and I, I don't know if you can put a fish on antidepressants but yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a question for someone smarter than me but they could sure look at that I'm coming <laughs> my steps are uh, in, in Paralictes olivaceus, they use a, to, de, to show that te temperature dependent sex determination in Japanese flounder was dependent on cortisol, they used a, uh, a blocker of cortisol synthesis. And I'm trying to think of the name. It's not, it's not yeah, what, what's it called? Mit Materapon, yeah. Um, I don't know that you'd want to apply that, but. But in any case, I had a question. So do you know what temperature is roughly like when you stock them? I mean, yeah, usually I, I'm just curious. It's, it's it ranges from year to year, but it's been as low as 19 to 20 and as high as 22 to 24. That I think we've seen so just depending on the time of year. That's not yeah. a bad. bad yeah, it's, it's a nice window. Not, yeah. Feel OK about it. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. I guess uh, this is Henry from Auburn. Um, I guess this is kind of a question for you and Dr. Borsky. Um, is the does the stress can the stressor be acute or is it mostly chronic that causes the sex shifts? And two, would an acute stress like transport be a deal breaker? <laughs> yeah. Are you are question. you basically dooming them by hauling them in a truck right when their sex is? Yeah, I don't have that answer, but. Like I like we said, we got a lot of things to look at, and when yeah. we kind of break out into our, our we don't sessions, have that well, answer either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we tried to do it periodically, right? Um, mm -hmm. But is one big acute stressor effective? I I don't think we know that yet. Yeah. Uh, one thing, so the thirty-five to sixty-five comes from that temperature shift experiment that mm -hmm. um, was mentioned earlier from Texas. Nice, nice study. And but that was all they looked at. They shifted them at 35. Mm -hmm. We have some gene expression data that, based on that, I suspect it's happening around 50 to 55 is when they become males. And if they don't, then they go on and become females. That's what the data suggests. But we we don't have experimental tests of that. So that might, but that might be a useful thing to know because you might have that extra 50 millimeters. And after you transport them, then maybe they have a chance to chill out. <laughs> Got one more in the back, or are we done? One more. Oh. Hey, Max, it's Andy Fisher from Wildlife and Fisheries. How you doing? Yeah. Um, I think we discussed this when we visited your hatchery uh, last year, but I was curious, are, are you guys still working to possibly mark, maybe genetically mark your fish before you release them so that you can kind of go back and look at the um, what, sex, what sexes these fish are, are 
turning out to be as they grow? Yeah, hundred percent. We're we're trying to gather the funding and and get those plans in place to start putting some effort towards looking at that. Thank you, Max. Thanks, guys. All right, our last talk of the day. Uh, we're going to stay on the topic of stock enhancement. Uh, Paul Kaysen at, is going to tell us about the efforts in Texas. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Steve. Well, my name is Paul Kaysen. I'm the hatchery manager at Sea Center, Texas. And I'm going to give you an overview of our stock enhancement program for Southern Flounder with Texas Parks and Wildlife. So um, just a quick overview on what we're going to look at today. I'm going to give you a very quick summary of our stock enhancement program, uh, give you a little bit of the history of our program, and then I want to uh, briefly highlight some production numbers, and then we'll look at some bottlenecks to stock enhancement and also some uh, knowledge gaps, as we've identified quite a few just within the last present couple presentations. So we... Um, the Coastal Fisheries Division of Parks and Wildlife has uh, a whole lot of water to cover. We have eight, or I'm sorry, nine major bay systems, um, over 3,300 miles of coastline, and our state waters go out nine nautical miles. So that gives us over 4 million uh, acres of salt water that we're in charge of managing. So in combination with traditional management techniques, we also have a very robust stock enhancement program. So we've got three facilities strategically located up and down the coast. Um, our southernmost hatchery is named the Marine Development Center. Uh, that's located in Corpus Christi, and that's also our oldest facility. It came online in 1983. And um, for the Middle Coast, we have the Periar Bass Marine Fisheries Research Station, which is located in Palacios. Um, that's a, that facility was built in the mid-70s, but in 1993, the pond, uh, the pond portion of that facility was designated towards the Stock Enhancement Program. And then for the Upper Texas Coast, we have Sea Center, Texas, uh, which is in Lake Jackson. And so that's a marine fish hatchery, but it also has a visitor center and a public aquarium. So annually, coastwide, we aim to produce 15 million red drum fingerlings, uh, between 8 and 10 million spotted sea trout fingerlings, and then as many southern flounder as we can possibly produce. And right now we're shooting for a minimum of 100,000 southern flounder. So just to give you an idea of how long we've been working at this, we, we started our efforts in 2006. Um, back in those times, it was just whatever effort we could muster up in the off season when we weren't currently raising red drum and spotted sea trout. So we had very minimal resources devoted specifically for southern flounder. Um, and we current, you know, with our red drum and trout production, that was... We do that primarily in the ponds, so we had uh, minimal experience with intensive aquaculture methods. So in the early days, we did try some pond uh, trials, and we had really mixed results. It just depended on if we stocked the fry when the temperature window was, uh, when it was a good temperature window. So we've more or less abandoned any pond culture attempts for southern flounder. So we've had 16 years of slow but steady progress working with Southern Flounder. We had just tremendous challenges early on, the first of which was acquiring enough brood stock to work with. And um, just as we heard in the, the last presentation, hatchery folks aren't, we like to go collect fish, but we're not always the most effective at doing so. So, um, as we saw in Quentin Hall's presentation, there are some people that are very good at collecting flounder um, when we saw the presentation on the gig fishery. So we have moved towards um, enlisting those professional anglers and highly skilled recreational anglers to have them assist us with our collections. 
and that's really helped us acquire the number of broodstock that we need. Uh, we also, um, in the early days, started uh, trying to collect eggs from volitional spawns, and those were uh, sporadic, unpredictable, and we had very low fertilization rates. So from this point forward, we're using strictly um, strip spawning techniques using a gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Uh, once we were able to produce eggs reliably, then we were faced with larviculture issues. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, we didn't have a whole lot of resources devoted specifically for flounder, so we were adapting our red drum and spotted sea trout incubator tanks, trying to do our, our larviculture in systems that were not designed with any kind of temperature control in mind, and um, we weren't able to meet the water quality demands of uh, these larval flounder. So we've put tremendous effort into upgrading our equipment in that area. Once we were able to meet their physical parameters um, needed for survival, we then had to meet their nutritional requirements. And so we really had to uh, buckle down and learn a lot about live feed production. And so in 2013 to 2014, we changed our our techniques and we started using a three-day batch culture using a product called Ori One for culturing our rotifers and that has proven to be extremely reliable and predictable and allowed us to scale up quite a bit. So once we were able to feed these larvae then we very quickly ran out of incubator space and so we um, had, had no more floor space. We had no more room to work with these fish or to scale up our operations. So in 2020, we, well, before that, we had the buildings constructed, but in 2020, we finally got into these new flounder buildings that have been constructed. So just a quick overview on the broodstock at both facilities, the Marine Development Center in Corpus and at Sea Center, we have wild caught broodstock. Um, around 340 fish are housed in Corpus and then 350 individuals are housed in Lake Jackson. Uh, we, at each facility, we have them on temperature and photo period maturation cycles. We've got three groups of fish at each hatchery on, dis, on uh, independent photo periods. So that gives us a pretty good sized window of time to work with them. Pretty much from October through March, we could be strip spawning fish. So that's a good good time period to work with them. Um, we're injecting them with the gonadotrophin releasing hormone. We're using ovaplant L and it seems to be pretty effective. And then we're conducting strip spawns at 48 and 72 hours. So on your left, you can see a picture of the new building in Corpus. That is uh, the new flounder building. It's 3,200 square feet. It has a larviculture room, a live feed production room, and also a couple of offices. And then on the right side of the screen, that's our new building in Lake Jackson. It's 2,700 square feet, and it just has the larva culture room and then the live feed production room. So here's a look at the interior of the building in Corpus. Um, on the lower Texas coast, we have much higher salinity, so they're able to utilize flow through so they've got 15 flow through incubators. They're about hundred gallons a piece. And then they've also in that room, they've got a 200 gallon uh, broodstock holding tank that's not pictured there. But um, since it is flow through, one of the limitations is all of the water cycling through that system is all the same temperature. So independent temperature control on each one of those incubators has to be modified by putting a drop-in chiller or, or a drop-in heater into the tank. Um, and our estimate is that when things are running uh, smoothly, we should be able to produce about 80,000 post-metamorphic fish every 50 days. Here's a picture of the flounder, the inside of the flounder building in Lake Jackson. We've got much lower and variable salinity on the upper Texas coast. So we have to use recirculating systems and we have to artificially increase the salinity. And so what we've got is five independent recirculating systems. And we have, it's, it basically consists of a raceway, 
with 200 liter incubators nested inside that, that raceway. So it serves as a water bath. So that gives us extremely good uh, thermal stability. And since they're independent systems, we have temperature control on each one. And we also estimate that we can produce about 80,000 fish every 50 days when things are uh, hitting on all cylinders. So here's a, just a, another look at, at the building. This is um, the live feed production rooms. On the left is Sea Center, and those are about 500 liter tubs for our three-day batch cultures. And then the Marine Development Center is pictured on the right. So here is some of our production data for the last 10 years. And you'll notice that it is highly variable. Um, okay, we've had uh, you know high years stocking 114,000 fish. And this is a combination of the Corpus Christi stocking and then also um, the stockings we've done in Lake Jackson. Uh, and then we've had years where we uh, barely produce anything. So one thing we've learned about flounder is just when you think you've got it figured out, they're going to throw you a curveball. So uh, anyone looking to produce flounder, I wish you luck. It's, it's really been tough, but it is doable. Um, I would like to point out that um, in 2021, last year, we had our lowest, our lowest year in the last 10 years. And uh, that had a lot to do with the, the facility in Lake Jackson. We did not, we haven't produced hardly anything in the last three years. And I'll get to that in a later slide. But the Corpus Hatchery was having some issues with temperature control and some equipment failure. Um, and then this year, so 2022, is on target to be our best year yet. We've, we've released over 58,000 fish so far, and we've got lots of fish at both facilities that are still going to be released this year. And we're going to be back at it starting in October with another uh, run of production. So we'll continue adding to that total and hopefully um, exceed our previous years. So now I wanna shift and talk about some bottlenecks to stock enhancement. This issue has come up repeatedly. So y'all now understand that Southern Flounder exhibit genotypic sex determination, but also phenotypic uh, sex reversal in that window that's 35 to 65 millimeters, or possibly a, a, a narrower window now. But, um, this is a serious consideration for stock enhancement. So um, in contrast to what we've heard about on, in, on the East Coast and uh, the studies coming out of North Carolina, um, Texas studies have shown that the temperature that gives us a one-to-one -one sex ratio is 18 degrees, which is significantly lower than what the East Coast studies have shown. And so this is really problematic from an aquaculture perspective because fish grown at 18 degrees grow very slow. So take a look at the photo on the right. And that's a 55 day post hatch flounder that's right around 12 millimeters. If Max had his fish for 55 days, they would be saddle blankets by then. Um, so we're seeing a very slow, very slow growth rate. Um, and that's, that's going to be a serious challenge for scaling up. Um, it also is going to determine the size and the season um, that we release. We need to either keep them past that window or be releasing them in a season when uh, they'll have a good chance of, of, uh, of being in the, the temperature range that gives them the one-to-one -one ratio when we release them. Another bottleneck is uh, stocking density. If you look at the picture on the top, you can tell that the that pre-metamorphic larvae have an interesting behavior of congregating together 
in really tight groups. So in the early life stages, it appears that stocking density is not really an issue because regardless of how much water you have available, uh, they're going to be aggregated in these groups and feeding, and they don't really seem to mind being close to each other. But if you look down at the bottom picture, you can see fish that have gone through metamorphosis and just notice uh, how much more space they need. They need real estate. So to scale this up, um, it's going to require a lot of surface area. So we're envisioning a two-phase approach where we can grow them at high density in, uh, in their pre-metamorphic stages. And then as soon as they're ready to transition or possibly right after they transition, we can move them into tanks with uh, quite a bit more surface area and give them the space that they need. So another uh, bottleneck is the temperature and salinity requirements of these fish in their early life stages. So this is, I don't see aquaculture for southern flounder being possible unless you have very uh, precise temperature control available. So we're going to have to be doing this in climate controlled facilities. Um, that can be expensive. Um, Independent temperature control on individual incubators is also really favorable if you can swing that. That gives you just more flexibility to grow them at different temperatures depending on uh, what the latest study says is optimal. And then locations with low or variable salinity are going to have to take that into account for both your brood stock and for larva culture. In the salt, the, the type of salt does matter. So the graph on the right side of the screen shows um, production data for sea center. And uh, the major difference between our best year and uh, our best season, which was the winter of 2017 and spring of 2018, um, we had three, three terrible years. And then we're back having a good year this year. The, the biggest difference that I can identify between those years is the brand of salt that we were using. And uh, after talking with Aaron, he, he came and visited our facility a couple months ago, and we made one change, and we're, we're back to producing flounder after just changing the salt brand. And the main difference is we're using an anhydrous salt, so we're assuming that there's an anti-caking component to some of the synthetic sea salts that could have been causing our low returns. And then other knowledge gaps, which have kind of been touched on, is pigmentation. Um, it's possible that, that tank color and maybe lighting have a part to play in that, but also nutrition is very likely to have a part in that. We need, we need to know the sex ratio of our stocked fish. Uh, that's extremely important for moving forward with stock enhancement. And then also determining if these fish that we're releasing into the wild, if they're surviving. And then we've kind of touched on this, but we need to know, does the temperature or culture conditions prior to reaching that window of uh, the 35 to 65 millimeter window, does that matter? Can we possibly push them at an increased temperature to get maximum growth um, up to that window and then cool them down and uh, put them at an optimal temperature? Is that possible? Uh, these are just seeds for future research. And then other considerations, of course, with any stock enhancement program, genetics has got to be um, at the top of your list of considerations. So it's uh, widely known that there are gen there's a genetic structure. There's two different stocks between the Atlantic and the Gulf. Um, but within um, a system, is there a genetic structure? And we've heard a little bit about this this morning, but there is uh, some studies show that there is some evidence of divergence between um, flounder on the north Texas coast, the upper coast, and flounder on the lower coast. Um, and other studies show that there is uh, very limited evidence for that. 
So until we have more information, we're going to play it safe and be conservative and um, keep our return our fish to the return our reared fish to the place where the brood stock came from. So at Sea Center, our brood stock have come from Galveston Bay. Their offspring are going back into Galveston and down to the Marine Development Center. Their brood stock came from Aransas Bay and they're stocking back into Aransas. I'll take any questions. So we have time for maybe one or two quick questions if there are any. Then we need to get started on our poster session. Make sure those folks have a chance to show off. Any questions? Sorry. Uh, uh, quick question. So it looked like from the graph of your production, y'all had been producing fish for about 10 years or so. Um, <clears throat> you said in your knowledge gaps, you needed to determine the survival of your release fish. So if you've been working on this this long and don't know the survival of your release fish, what are your metrics that you're using for success in terms of your hatchery program? Right now we're in the infancy of... Uh, flounder stock enhancement. We're trying to just get get them through metamorphosis consistently, and um, and then once we get to that point, we can hopefully start to design some experiments to to look at things like survival in the wild. It's been so hit and miss. It would not be up to this point. We would disappoint researchers, I think, if we were trying to do a survival study and then we had a year where we didn't produce anything. So we've really just been trying to refine our techniques. These new buildings that have been constructed are going to allow us to do that. Um, we just got in them and we've pretty much just worked the kinks out. And so that is some, that's a question that we need to answer. We've looked, we've, with our red drum uh, stock enhancement, we have um, genetic studies to verify that they are surviving. And we're currently working on that with spotted sea trout right now too. But at this point, we haven't gotten gotten there with flounder. One more. Hey, Paul, Michael Lee with the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. So y'all have been doing it long enough to have females for many years. Have you strip spawned the same female from, say, year three to what would be like an eight-year-old female? I don't think that we've kept them that long. Okay, so you're we, changing out the genetics. Yes, so flounder cycle themselves out. Okay. We we have not, um, we we do have good, we haven't lost any after a strip spawner. It's very rare if we do. And we, we now have our fish pit tag so we can track that really well. And um, we will strip spawn the same female a couple times. It's not uncommon for us to strip spawn the same female a couple times within a year and then again another year but we are definitely not keeping them for you know six seven eight years okay. and we we find that some of the smaller fish seem to handle better produce a little bit better so we're not really trying to grow out gigantic you know huge fish so with, no evidence of a fecundity seat increase over like a few we years. haven't looked at it too close but anecdotally i would say no Okay. All right. Let's give a round of applause for everybody, all the speakers today in both sessions. This was a, a great day with a lot of talks. Certainly got me thinking. I've heard a lot of great conversations around the room. Uh, please join us for day two tomorrow, although right now uh, we have three posters or four. Three, we have three posters we'd like you to go out and check out. Um, that will maybe transition into a, a happy hour. I'm not sure what time does that start, Steve? 5.30. 5.30 happy hour. Um, That's not for the YouTube folks, though. Right. It's just for, just for people present. <laughs> yeah. An in-person happy hour. In-person happy hour. <clears throat> Uh, and then, again, we start up at 9 a.m. tomorrow. The morning session is going to be our movement and migration session. 
we'll break for lunch, and then we're going to do a synthesis session and try to bring all these ideas back and see what we can cook up. So, anything else? What am I missing? Yeah, I just need to apologize to uh, to Aaron, Shelby, Dave Smith, and to Max. Uh, apparently, the last four abstracts did not make it into the program, so either no one looked at them. Mine's not in there either. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> none of them have it. And wait. Oh, yeah, Midway's not in there either. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah, so we're going to redo the program when it's online. It'll be available as a pub um, on the commission page after the meeting. We'll make sure we get them all in and get them all straight. So I apologize. It's a hectic week. Great. We'll see, you, see everyone at the pub.